lately I've got a lot of news about people dying from COVID. One of them lost their father who contracted it from other family members. Protecting from your close ones is difficult. Death can come without warning. It is a natural process. Where there is birth, there is death. It is inevitable. Only sooner or later, if we understand and accept this fact of life, then we won't suffer from it. What's more important is whether we accumulate goodness or badness more while we live. Do we have any regrets? Is there any good deed we haven't done? Any bad behavior we need to get rid of but have not? Thinking about those unfulfilled good deeds and the still tangled bad behaviors will sadden us. Unless we want to feel this path at death's door. We must do the good deeds and alienate the bad before our last day. Don't cry for help from any divine being when death already comes knocking. First understand this. Buddhism teaches self-reliance. Asking for help from any celestial is not Buddhism. Most people don't have a good grasp on Buddhist teaching. They hope to rely on special beings like other religions with their gods or deities. Many people do not even know the reasons we pay respect to the Buddha statue. The Buddha statue is the visual imagery representing all the benevolence of the Buddha, mainly his great wisdom. He all by himself blazed the path to cessation of suffering, leading him to the transcendent liberation. Furthermore, he graciously passed his wisdom on to us, showing us how to walk the path and reach our liberation. Teaching someone to attain enlightenment is by no mean a small feat. When we pay respect to the statue, we contemplate the benevolence of the Buddha. Some people wish upon the Buddha statue the same as the statues of deities for help and gifts. They are ignorant to the law of karma, always begging for something. The Buddha never taught such a thing. Unfortunately, many people view the Buddha like a deity, existing to grant their wishes. The same with Dhamma. Now, this one is the most complicated. It is hard to think about. Let's put this one aside for now. Now, the Sangha. It is not about thinking about this master or that teacher. When we think of Sangha, if we think, oh, Long Bu Tua, please help me. Oh, Long Bu So and So, please help me. Then we are still worshipping them as a deity still. When we think about Sangha, we think about the goodness of monks whose conduct is good, right, and on the path, whose practice does Dhamma justice and to attain liberation. Monks who walk this path, they honor precepts 
and had concentration and wisdom. In the beginning, they were just like us, with deep-rooted defilement and all. But they had great fortitude. Once they received the Buddha's teaching, they followed through and ultimately attained Dharma. They are worthy of our homage. We pay respect to Sangha as a representation of someone who overcame defilements. They are our example, our goal, that one day we will also reach such a state. We will, if we persevere, we pay respect to Sangha as in paying homage to their goodness, not worshipping them as a deity or God. What can angels really do for us? As far as paying respect to angels, can a Buddhist do so? We can. We, however, pay respect to the goodness that the person does to become an angel. We pay respect to goodness. Similarly, when we pay homage to the Buddha, it is for his benevolence. We pay homage to the graciousness of Dhamma. We pay respect to Sangha for the virtues of those respectable monks. Similarly, we pay respect to the virtues that those angels did allowing them to become angels. There's no reason not to respect virtuous people. At the least, these people upheld precepts. Besides, they had moral shame and moral dread. Many of us keep precepts incorrectly though. They do it by suppressing themselves. On the contrary, angels keep precepts because they have moral shame and moral dread. They feel ashamed doing bad deeds and dread the repercussions. See how they are superior to us? So, is it okay to pay an angel respect them? Yes, but not in ways like worshipping a deity, only to ask them to help or grant wishes, like helping our country. It is our country. If we don't help our own country, who would? Not even the angels can. If the people in that country don't have morals and virtues, exploit and oppress each other, peacefulness and happiness are just impossible. Even angels cannot help with that. We must be logical. We Buddhists pay homage to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. There's nothing wrong about paying respect to the angels or the ancestors. There is nothing wrong about attending ancestor worship ceremonies. It is in memorial to their graciousness and benevolence to our generation or our country. We reminisce our gratitude for their contributions or the reminder of how we as the descendants should follow. Even if the ancestors were dishonorable, dealing substances, scamming or corrupting, for instance. That is still a good example. It shows us that in spite of all those dishonorable gains, they still leave this world with nothing but the curses from those who think of them. These are lessons from our ancestors, showing us the bad conducts to avoid and the good ones to follow. Whatever we pay respect to, those respects must be towards their virtues, be it the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, or the angels and the ancestors only reach for their Dharma, and our lives would develop and advance on the path towards happiness and peacefulness. When I visit other temples, besides appreciating the artistic beauty, I meditate. The energy at some places helps the mind to be bright and peaceful. I go to pay respect to the Buddha's images for the spiritually positivity, not for wishes. I've been like this since being a child. My grade school was a temple school. So during breaks, I often went to sit alone in the temple chapel. 
there was only an old decayed Morta Buddha statue. I would pay respect and meditate, observing my breath, in, put, out, to. This is how to pay homage, to pay respect and to meditate. I never asked for any special being to help, to help me meditate well, never. Good or bad, it is all up to ourselves. Having said that, I'm not prohibiting it. Paying homage to the Buddha's image is a good thing. It is only that while doing it, we must truly pay homage to the Buddha. Don't just treat it as a gold, mortar or brass that looks like him. Do you think there is any energy in the statue? Of course, both good and bad energy. However, some national or regional statues do have powerful celestial energy. When angels feel the bond with any statue, they frequently come to pay respect. Hence accumulated energy. When we pay respect or meditate there, our mind can concentrate easier due to the positive and pure energy. Unlike the pups or bars, negative energy gathers there from all the drunkards and debauchees. Simply the pit of defilements, our mind just runs rampage being in such an environment. I had never gone to such places since I was a layman. Well, I went to a discotheque once with my colleagues. It would consider antisocial not going in, since everybody else already did. With flashing colorful lights, booming music, alcohols and cigarette adores, my mind went all over the map. My heart felt dismay, thinking this was just like hell. It was like in packetry with all the flashing lights and loud noises. Some masters said that even with normal regular ears, our ears would almost split even from hundreds of kilos away. It is that loud and excruciating. This place was a replica of the purgatory. People drank copper water in these pots, bars, and the discotheques and enjoyed it. Pity filled my heart seeing it. I snapped out the first chance I got when others did not pay attention and went to a temple to pay respect to the master. There's always alcohol, especially on the company's trip. Government officers love such a program. I always try to find my way out doing some homework on what masters were in those places beforehand. If there was one in the area and it was not too late, I would snap out and pay him a visit. I had met many great masters this way. Why should I waste my time in purgatory with hungry ghosts, asuras and animals who were drowned in delusions? I am not judging them though. They are just behaving suitably to the realms they belong to. One day, when their spiritual and mental states progress, they won't behave like that anymore. It wasn't the day just yet, so they were like that. They just had to suffer more first, but it wasn't for me. Dharma exists everywhere, not only at the temples or with the masters. We can see Dharma paying homage to the Buddha's image, contemplating his teaching, or when thinking about the masters or the Sangha, even when we think about the bad realms, either in the purgatory or this earth realm, we can see Dharma. This world is full of delusion. People are deluded that they are happy when there isn't true happiness. Their so-called happiness is still a burning sensation, while Dharma gives a peaceful happiness. With concentration, 
our mind is calm and refreshing, peaceful and content feeling permeates every fiber of our being. Even if we happen to be in a cold country or are thinking about Dharma, our meditation or the Buddha, warm and comforting energy envelops us. It is astonishing, really, to feel cool when thinking that in a hot place and warm when in a cold place. It is unusual, but not at all exaggerated. Gradually cultivate ourselves. If our mind always connects to Dharma, it will be peaceful and content. In the hot place, it will feel cool, much better than in an AC room. The mind will feel fresh and alive. If it's hot when we meditate, a cool sensation will spread throughout our entire body. It is a very refreshing sensation. In a cold environment, thinking about the Buddha while meditating can cause warmth spreading in our chest. Warm and comfortable sensation will cover us to our hands and down to our feet warming all the fingers. This is all about energy. Thinking about good things brings positive things to us, while thinking about bad things attracts bad things into our life. The mental and moral state of people these days is rooted in delusion. We must brave the weights. Don't get swept away with the current. The world is just a jumble of delusion and chaos. Don't get tangled up in it. We live with, but not entrapped by it. It is something we have to live with, like we can't escape out of space, right? So we live with all the chaos, but we live astutely and see Dharma that occurs perpetually in our heart. Surrounded by wholesome things influences positivity. Happy and peaceful environment is a result of our good karma, which cultivates precepts, concentration, and wisdom. Happiness and peacefulness is the fusion of our accumulated virtues. If we happen to be in such a depressing place as a pub, a bar, or a brothel, then we'll only see suffering. It is filled with deluded, pitiful people. There is nothing appealing but pitiable. It is a difficult topic. If we cannot give constructive warning, then we are better off not saying anything or risk stirring an unnecessary fight. It is easier to simply not follow those people. If we have to go with, then try fortifying our resolve, our mindfulness and conscious. In my case, because I was with the officers who enjoyed drinking, it wouldn't be straight out to announce that I didn't drink and I dislike you. It would only make our life difficult. So just eat snacks while they drink. Let them drink or drool over women as they want. Our job is to protect our heart, keeping ourselves untainted. We won't be embarrassed in front of our teachers unless we did something bad. We'd feel ashamed and couldn't meet their eyes. Has this ever happened to you? People want to meet me, but when they do, they can't even look at me. That's a telltale sign that they have done something bad. We must keep training ourselves. Dharma is everywhere around us. Knowing what to see, and we'll see Dharma, and Sangha around us. Then again, there's also evils. Both heaven and hell exist around us. So we must cultivate ourselves, trying to gradually eradicate defilement, while unceasingly accumulate wholesomeness. Don't be gullible. Easily believe and just follow what we hear, whether what prompted is a real deal or a hoax. Use our intuition and intelligence to analyze. Don't just believe because others do.
เอกหลวงพ่อโสธร statue for example which before covid I went to pay respect occasionally I have been familiar with this statue since I was a child as my father took me there often while paying the respect I would think about the respectable masters the peacefulness and happiness as I meditated nowadays though There's only the replica, as the original one's gone under conservation many times. But they have to put it in the chapter house. The new one now is the brass version of the original mortar one, which was destroyed during the chapel construction. There's a huge court out front, which is occupied by boiled eggs. And traditional dancer as votive offerings. I am not commenting. It is actually rather quaint. It could be me doing that. But fortunately, I've met masters and my parents who taught me about food offering, keeping precepts, and listening to Dharma teachings. I was born in a family with the right view, not affluent, but fortunate with moralities and tamma. I see those who are lured by illusions, offering boiled eggs to Long Po So Tong even in the afternoon. What monk would eat at such a time? Long Po So Tong doesn't. He's probably already sick of seeing tons of eggs every day. The same with the Brahma statue. Whom people love offering boiled eggs and coconut juice, which are high in cholesterol. The Brahma must be so scared. So what do we pay respect to Brahma then? To his virtues, of course. Why does he have four faces? It's the symbol of the four great virtues: loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. The mind that possesses these attributes is that of a Brahma, while moral shame and moral dread characterize the mind of a deity. Morality is the attribute of a human mind. So, whenever we pay respect to anything, think about their respectable virtues. Even with a bad experience, we can still see Dharma behind it. Wonder why people behave like that? Because they are deluded. Why are they so absorbed? Because they are negligent. Why do they indulge? Because of cravings such as desires for women or men. These days, women are men isers. Men nowadays must watch out, keeping themselves safe, unlike before. Women have become braver and stronger. The role has shifted these days. We have to comprehend all this with no discrimination. Even when seeing someone doing something bad, we don't condemn them. If we view them with contempt, then we are doing a bad deed. For example, we don't like politicians and constantly write criticisms. And disruptive comments about them, we are practically doing bad conduct, not unlike them. Regardless of who or where we are, we must protect our heart and be able to see Dharma in everything. See Dharma in a Buddha statue, in a teacher, in a statue of a deity, or a Brahma statue. Going to a funeral or seeing a coffin, everything shows dharma to us. Or even in a place full of vices, dharma exists everywhere, whether or not we see it. It is the matter of whether we are able to use it to cultivate ourselves, even though it's not anything so elusive. Keep on cultivating ourselves. And one day we'll see that there isn't an aged, sick, or a dead person. Why? 
because there isn't an us, there isn't a person. There are two tiers to Dharma practice. The first is to train ourselves to not be so selfish. This is one Dharma lesson for living in the world, to live unselfishly, not immersed in indulgence, getting lost in the worldly tide. We can live in the world unselfishly, be generous and gracious towards others, man and animal alike. This is how to live in the world. The next level goes beyond just not being selfish to not being non-self. See that this body is in the self. See that the happiness and suffering aren't self. Neither are the goodness or badness, or the perceptions which are the consciousness at the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mind are also non-self. This is the wisdom in the supra-mundane level. Attaining this starts at not being selfish. It's impossible to see non-self when we are still so selfish. Since we are still living in the world, then learn to reduce our self-absorption. Donate when the occasion arises, for instance. Keeping precepts is also a way to reduce selfishness. Learning not to yield to the defilement by refraining from immersing in happiness, dissoluteness, indulgence, and selfishness. Happiness is only temporary in the midst of the more lasting suffering. Hence, train ourselves not to be selfish. Try reducing it. If we want to be liberated from this world, then really see the truth of this body and mind. See into it until we see that there isn't a self. There is nothing to be selfish for, because there isn't a self. There is no self anywhere but only materiality and mentality. This is the path of the fully enlightened ones. They don't ignore the worldly good deeds, however. They all contribute when the occasions arise. They also all uphold moralities and dharma practice because their real goal is liberation from all suffering. They make real sacrifices. They sacrifice that comfort and indulgence, giving up all the familiar worldly gratifications to truly learn about themselves. Eventually, they see the truth that there isn't a self. What do we see then, since there isn't a self? We see the rising and falling of the materiality and the rising and falling of the mentality. Realizing this wisdom means we attain the stream entry wisdom of the supramundane level, seeing that something that arises will soon disappear. Next to observing that there is no such thing as self but the rise and fall of materiality and mentality, we then observe that that rise and fall are nothing but suffering. Nothing besides suffering arises. Nothing besides suffering exists, and nothing besides suffering falls away. Truly realizing this wisdom, the mind is bound to a full liberation. We will realize this in the body first, because the body is the most tangible, thus easiest to observe. We will see that the body is suffering, and in its entirety, not just occasionally good or bad. Only when seeing this can we release our attachment to the body and attain the realm of the non-returner. Next is the cultivation focusing on the mind. From the beginning, we see that everything rises and falls and isn't a self. Then what exactly is it? It's suffering. Why is it suffering? Because it's impermanent under oppression to decay and not under our control. Understanding these aspects is the end of suffering. Fully understanding the three characteristics of the mind is cessation of suffering right there. This is a lesson for those with strong, solid faculties. When we progress through the course of the gradually higher Dharma, we will feel sympathy for our fellows in the world. They struggle, haggle, 
forever searching for happiness, which in the end is nothing but emptiness. They want things and everything only to be left with nothing. It is sad. It's not superiority that we will feel, or that we are more evil than them, or that we are the same as them. It is solely empathy. So, if we still feel hatred towards bad people, it's the reflection that our cultivation still isn't good enough. Or if we worship a virtuous person or thing as something supernatural, our dharma understanding is still inadequate. Keep cultivating ourselves. Gradually improve ourselves until we understand that there is nothing we are losing nor getting. Having said that, we are actually gaining the right view and giving up the wrong view. We are gaining the right understanding and knowledge about the truth of the world, and in turn, eliminating the wrong view. Once we have the correct view, Dharma will review itself everywhere we are. There is a piece in the scripture, not sure which, but I have also heard some masters mention it, saying that wherever an arahant is, that place is the suitable space. If he were in a bar. Which realistically he would not, but if he were, then the bar would become a suitable space. Confused? Let's say if an arahant appear in hell, hell would become suitable as well, because wherever he is, that place is serene and tranquil. Dharma is extraordinary, isn't it? In the proximity of a master, there is only warmth. And a comfortable breeze of tranquility. So, is it warm or cool? It's warm in the cool peace. We have those masters who exude happiness as our inspiration to cultivate. They were just like us at one point, full of struggles, mishaps, and errors. Everybody makes mistakes. There is not a single person who hasn't. Even killing someone, there were some arahans who had killed. That was when he were lay people, not when they were arahans. An example is Angulimala, who killed about a thousand victims. He happened to have a fortunate encounter with the Buddha, who later became his guiding light. He saw and was in awe, with the Buddha's serene and tranquil disposition. While he was full of burning restlessness, he wanted to be as serene and at peace. So he listened to the Buddha's teaching. He started cultivating, and soon enough, attaining the same tranquility and serenity as that of the Buddha. But before reaching such an untainted state, we all possess the impurities. Don't just beat ourselves up. But instead, start eliminating those bad behaviors. Start doing good deeds that we haven't done, and we'll be improving. Our worst enemy is our ignorance and the delusion and inability to distinguish right from wrong. Do you understand the teaching today? How can you practice it? First, keep in mind that there is dharma everywhere. Learn to see correctly, and we'll see dharma. Dharma for living in the world is to not be selfish. If we want to break free from the world, then see that there isn't an us, but the materiality and mentality. When paying homage to a Buddha statue, then think about the Buddha himself. Contemplate that he also had defilements and mistakes before, but still later attained such purity. Whatever dharma path he took, if we walk the same path, then that's what we will achieve one day as well. Keep teaching ourselves this, so when we pay homage, we don't go to ask for things. This is why there's a lot of corruption in Thailand. Such bribery is a widespread practice everywhere. Who are we to say? When we go to pay respect, only to beg, beg for help. Not to draw the red card at military service recruitment, right? Admit it. I, for one, didn't draw the red card, 
But unlike those so-called Buddhists, I took the reserve officer training. That's logical, isn't it? It's not because I go ask Lung Bu this or Lung Bu that to help. When asked to help dodging the draw, some master said, "All right, let you become a soldier instead, so you can truly experience it. So don't just be a beggar. Go cultivate yourselves." Now, homework. Question one: I do sitting meditation for forty-five minutes before going to work. My mind is overthinking and restless while meditating. I see that I can control the thinking mind as much as I try, and my chest becomes tight. But if I let it loose, then haziness clouds the mind. Lately, my mind is so restless that I cannot do any concentration meditation. Hence, the unstable mind. Could you please give me some advice while doing your concentration meditation? Don't let the mind sink into the lethargy or the dull state. What you are doing is incorrect. That's why the delusion seeps in. You must increase your mindfulness instead of meditating to gain concentration. Aim to be mindful of your body. Observe and be mindful of the body that's breathing in and out. Be mindful when the body is standing, walking, sitting, and laying down. Give importance to mindfulness instead of calmness. If you aim for calmness. The delusion will immediately cloud the mind. It's a matter of perspective. Now I'm going to keep being mindful of the phenomena instead of controlling my mind from wandering off or being lost in thought and so forth. Just keep knowing, and the mindfulness will gradually become proficient, and the concentration becomes better. If you keep at it, try to be mindful often. When the mind wanders off, you quickly be aware automatically. Then the mind will have a revelation that oh, so the mind can wander off on its own, and the awareness also happens on its own. And when it does, the mind becomes stable. The mind isn't me. Keep observing like this. Give your intention to mindfulness, not calmness. Because the dullness will consume your mind immediately. Whatever you are doing, be it standing, walking, sitting, laying down, cleaning your house, anything, be aware whenever the body moves. Adjust accordingly, and you will progress. Question two: I've been practicing for two years. I do my formal meditation every day using hand movement and walking meditation during the day. I observe the body mainly. Could you please give me further guidance? Just do it comfortably. Just be aware of the body, like when you are nodding down. Be aware when moving your hands. Don't just move the hands, but the mind is stuck still. It's like telling yourself that you are aware, but in fact the mind is too stiff. You control your mind too much. Allow it to be natural. Just be aware, but don't force your mind to be aware all the time, or to be good all the time. You are now still forcing your mind. Don't do that. Try nodding down. See, when nodding, your mind feels heavier. See how it happened. It was because you are too intentional in your awareness. If you nod casually. The mind won't feel any weight at all. So if you are so focused on moving your hands and the mind feels heavy, it's proof that you are interfering with the mind. That it's not natural. Keep patiently observing until it becomes natural. Your mind is not right because you are forcing it to be still. If it wants to be still, it will on its own without your interference. If you try to take control, the mind will be stiff, tense. Question three: My formal session is sitting meditation with chanting Buddha while observing the breath. My mind is normally busy every day. I practice mindfulness from waking up to going to sleep. I see that the mind is the taskmaster. Sometimes it's aware, sometimes lost in thoughts. I also see dislikes. 
Lately, I feel the defilement lurking and joking itself with contact. Now I am stuck in stillness and brightness. Do you know why you see defilement only after the contact? Because before the contact, there isn't any defilement. There's only latent dispositions without sense perception. Contact defilement won't activate. There's only the cankers that interact with the craving, aversion, and delusion. In short, the defilement only rises after their sense perception. There must be a contact. Then there will be a defilement to observe. Keep observing like this. What you are doing is all right, but you are stuck in an idle state. Don't stay there. Switch to observe the body. Seeing that this body is in a self, seeing this often enough, your mind will be free from being stuck in the stiffness. It's a concentration state that you are stuck in. When it's like that, shift to observing the body. Observing the mind at that point、It、might make it worse, so you are safer observing the body. The angle for observation is that this body isn't beautiful or endearing. It's impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not. The self. Observe bit by bit. Keep on teaching the mind, and eventually the mind will start working accordingly and know how to observe the three characteristics. This is what you are doing. See, it's not natural, isn't it? Good. If you can see this, you can get out of it. Let me clear this first. Ah, this right now is correct. Now it's not. See, it's slipping into motionlessness. Don't go to that state. Don't hang on to it. If the mind gets stuck in the idling state, just shift to observing the body. See that the body isn't beautiful, but loathsome and impure. It also is impermanent, suffering and non-self. Keep observing the body. It helps break free from the stillness. Question four. I meditate for thirty minutes, walking fifteen minutes, and praying in the morning and evening every day for over two years now. Initially, the mind seems to enter a resting state, but lately I see lots of thoughts coming and going while I sit. During the day, my mind seems a bit still, but I still can see some phenomena. Sometimes they stop, but sometimes the mind follows them. I'd like to know how I can improve further. That's correct, but can you see if your mind is at the base? It may sometimes or may not, but you need to be aware of it all. Like right now, can you see that your mind is off base? If yes, then you are doing okay, because other things aren't so problematic. What you are doing is good. Keep at it. When you do it correctly, then you only need to keep doing it until it's enough. When it's enough. The fruitfulness will present itself. Can you feel any benefit from Dharma practice yet? See any result? Does your distress last shorter? Any fewer? Any less? One can feel the result oneself. Good. Continue practicing. Question five. I use contemplation of the breath as my meditation. Sometimes I feel a ball of tightness in my chest. I'm still controlling, aren't I? Could you please give me some advice? Yes. Why? Because of craving, wanting to do well, wanting to meditate. Your default man is wanting to be good, to meditate, influencing the action, which is controlling. The retribution is then the tightness. The solution isn't tight because it's the result. We have to solve the cause. When the mind has craving, no so. When the craving to meditate arises, be aware of that craving. When the craving disappears, the controlling will too. Once the controlling stops, the tightness will lessen and gradually disappear. It's not immediate because it's the retribution of the action. We have to accept the karmic retribution first. If you overfocus so forcefully, then the tightness is severe consequently and does more suffering. If the overfocusing is light. 
then the suffering is also light. But if you don't over-focus at all, then there won't be such retribution, no controlling, no suppression. So our interest is at the cost. Wanting to be good, know that wanting. Wanting to meditate, know so. Then what do you do when you want to meditate? You meditate. But not because you want to be good. You meditate because it's the right thing to do. Meditate as an homage to the Buddha. Meditate to release, not to receive. Receiving what? Gratification, happiness, calmness, for instance. If you meditate to gain, then the more you meditate, the worse it will be. We meditate to eradicate our defilements, to become selfless, keep observing ourselves and our lives will improve. Worldly life will become more comfortable and so does the Dharma life. You are controlling again, not just controlling too, but yielding your mind to the dullness. In that dull, idle state, the mind becomes blurry, hazy because of the delusion. Wake yourself up. Increase your mindfulness, not calmness. If you are calm, but without consciousness, only calmness with haziness, then it's not acceptable. If you are aware and conscious, the mind will be calm by itself as a result. You are sliding into it again. Now that's how we are aware. See, now the mind is searching. Try to find something interesting to see. Be aware that it's searching and the mind will gradually become more stable. By seeing the true nature of the phenomena, the mind will automatically gain concentration. Basking the mind in the dull, idle state to gain concentration only gives you the incorrect concentration. Question 6. I meditate by doing good breathing in, to breathing out. Is what I am doing correct? What more should I do? It's correct and you are doing well. Keep doing it and be aware of the mind, of the mental formations. Right now I'm contemplating what I'm saying, right? So it can memorize it. Just know so. Know when the mind thinks. Be aware of whatever the mind is doing. Using butto with the breath is good. Keep on doing it. What you are doing is good. Your mind has enough strength. Patiently observe. See that everything that arises will fall off. While meditating, breathe in, but breathe out, to and observe the passing phenomena rising, existing, and falling off. You are sending your mind out now. Just know that it's sent out. While observing the breath, don't allow the mind to be dull. Most people let their mind bask in the dullness while meditating. Don't do that. Such a waste of time. Number six, your foundation is really good. Patiently continue your meditation. Question seven. With more free time, I now do walking meditation in the morning and evening. I am learning to practice during the day by chanting Bhutto while observing the mental movement, but I'm still not very good at it. May I have further guidance, please? What you are doing is fairly good. Keep on doing it until it's enough. If you can do it from waking up until sleeping is the best. During the free time, spend observing the phenomena. If you can see the mind, then observe the mind. If not, then observe the body instead. 
If you cannot see either one, then chant putto. While saying putto, and the mind is busy, simply know so. Or if the mind is calm, then know so. Soon you will be able to see the mind. We chant putto to allow us to see the mind. Putto is the mind because it means the one who knows is awake and joyful, which is how our mind fundamentally is. So we chant putto and observe the mind. Don't overfocus the mind until it's stiff and still. Though now, now you are doing just that. If you focus on it, the mind will be too still. If that happens, switch to observing the body, wondering. Just know so. Be aware of the phenomenon in the very present moment. See it passes by, but keep chanting putto. See, our mind changes all the time. This is how we chant putto and see the changes in the mind. Note, though, that we need enough concentration for the observation, or the mind would delve into the phenomena. If we chant putto without enough centered strength, the mind will immerse in chanting putto and will overfocus on putto. When we think and our concentration isn't enough, the mind will be lost in that thought. Or we are happy and we know that we are, but without enough concentration, the mind would dwell in that happiness. This is what is called the mind isn't stable. If the mind is not stable, come back to chanting putto and be aware when the mind wanders off. The mind will gradually become stable. When the mind moves again, and we know so, it will stop making the mind become increasingly stable. The mind will become more prominent and concentrated enough that we can progress onto wisdom cultivation. If it's just staying stable, however, it's just like charging the battery and just leaving it to leak unused. A master's analogy to the situation is of putting the water into the freezer to make ice. Then we take the ice out and leave it out, letting it melt into liquid. Then we put it back into the freezer again. He compared this to those who gain concentration but don't know how to use it effectively. It's a waste. We do calmness meditation for energy reserve. For the mind to use in wisdom cultivation, so use it to cultivate wisdom, or the mind just becomes still and dull. Now we know the real purpose of calm meditation, which is to support our wisdom development, not for the mind to be dwelling in the trance or forgetting about the body and mind. Now you are sending the mind out and searching, trying to find something to see. See. The mind is being restless. Now, see when the mind is aware of that, it becomes joyful. See that it becomes joyful on its own. Keep observing like this. See that it can also become sleepy by itself. Question eight: Mind meditation is breathing in, put breathing out, to as and knowing when the mind wanders off. Last time you told me to see my ego and defilements. I do see my ego and craving when the mind wants to indulge in perceptions. My mind becomes restless after about twenty minutes of sitting meditation. It's so busy that I cannot see the phenomena. When doing shawls, I can see the mind goes to the floor or at the hands, the cloth. Or with the chanting words, please give me some guidance. That's it. At your age, only observing the mind isn't good enough because it drifts off or becomes hazy too easily. You must use your body observation along with it. You see the mind more clearly when dusting or cleaning the house, while cleaning the floor, and the mind moves to the floor. Be aware of that. Or when the mind goes off elsewhere, also know so. Use your body as the home base. When the mind immerses into something, know so. It goes off to think, know so. Use the body to help. Observing the mind alone is not enough. It will quickly become hazy and drift off, or even fall asleep. Due to the age, using the body will help. 
What you are doing is good, but it will be better with body observation. Be aware when the body moves. See the body that it isn't a self, but something similar to a robot. The mind gives the order to the body to do things. Sometimes it may wander off and forget about the body. The mind might go to the floor or off to think. Simply know so. With the addition of body observation, you see the mind even more clearly. Good. Go meditate more.